Please take your seats. Great. Morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2024 Digital Skills Summit. Uh, my name is David Osim. I'm director of research at the Lisbon Council, a Brussels-based think tank, who convenes this summit under the banner of Road Steamer, a three years initiative to develop STEAM education, a roadmap for STEAM education in Europe, which the Lisbon Council coordinates. You know what STEM means, science, technology, engineering, uh, and mathematics. STEAM goes a step further and adds an element of uh, interdisciplinarity creativity and real world connection in ways to both increase student interest in these disciplines and also to foster the ability to think out of the box and adapt to a changing world. So the problem we address today, I think we all know what is this about. Europe is facing a skills gap. The education system is struggling to be able to build a talent pool, able to flourish in an increasingly digital and interconnected world. The targets that the digital compass has set, 80% of people with basic digital skills, 20 million ICT specialists by 2030 are far from being met. We are not on track. And the lack of competencies of the European Union is a persistent bottleneck. Now, this is, becomes even more important with the advent of new revolutions such as generative AI. Europe needs to be equipped with an adequate pool of digital talent to be able to remain competitive. Okay, this is not new. No, we have been talking about this a long time. This is not the first conference on this topic in Brussels, talking about what should be done. Today, we aim different. Because the European Commission has embarked on a long and hard work to a strategic dialogue to deliver a new council recommendation that set the context for a coordinated European action on digital skills. This is big news. This is a big novelty. Member states are expected to deliver strategies, whole of government strategies, and are accountable for what they deliver. Now, the recommendation goes a long way into detailing what needs to be done, and it has an original focus on informatics I recommend to all of you to read it. It shows the effort that was in it. It is not just an abstract call for more action, a clear analysis of what needs to be done to make it happen. So in line with that, today we are here not just to talk about what needs to be done, but to be inspired for action and to learn from the best. We have a great range of speakers who will share their insight on improving the provision of computer skills and training. The summit will be opened by Pierre and Kilde Hansen, Director General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture of the European Commission, newly appointed Director General. We also have a new commissioner, so it's really a fresh start for digital skills. We then have two fantastic initiatives, Hadi Partovi, the founder and chief executive officer of Code.org, will talk about the secrets behind this initiative that managed to bring computer education to 80 million U uh, US students and change computer education for good in the curriculum, in the school curriculum. And then we have online Valeria Yonan, Deputy Minister for EU Integration for Ukraine, who will talk about the success and the lessons learned from DI education an initiative that has equipped 1.5 million Ukrainians with digital skills in the last three years, incidentally, during a war. And then, and then we have some of the staunchest advocates for digital skills for all Europeans. We have Enrico Nardelli, professor of informatics at Tor Vergata University and former president of Informatics Europe, <laughs> who will talk about the importance of informatics as a third language for, that every citizen should learn. Then we have online Member of Parliament and Vice Chair of the Committee on Cultural Education, Victor Negrescu, who will bring his own perspective, a long-standing advocate for digital skills for all Europeans. And last, last not, but not least, Antonita Angelova Kristeva, Kasteva, Director of Innovation, Digital Education and International Cooperation 
and the Director General for Education of the European Commission will wrap up the panel talking about what this all means for the implementation of the Council recommendation. We will have interaction, we will welcome comments and interventions. Uh, the session is on the record, there are journalists present, and I think that's all. In the interest of time, let me welcome uh, Pia Arenkilden Hansen. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, David. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure uh, for me to be here today which, uh, with such uh, <coughs> distinguished pa participants and uh, <coughs> a great audience. Uh, and first of all, I would of course like to thank uh, Lisbon Council for, for organizing this very, very timely event uh, on a fundamental topic which certainly uh, is at the very heart uh, of our daily work in the European Commission. Uh, you know that, of course, perfectly well that this Commission has made uh, uh, one of its main priorities to ensure that Europe, uh, on all counts, is fit uh, for the digital age. And I could not agree more when it comes to the, the, the subject that you have uh, uh, invited us to focus on uh, today. Uh, the time is now. Uh, digital innovation is indeed accelerating and it permeates uh, more than ever every aspect of our societies, of our democracies uh, and indeed if our citizens uh, do not understand on that count also the world in which they live then our societies will find themselves less empowered to address their challenges at the mercy of, who, of those who can use and even abuse uh, these innovative tools. And we've seen the importance of understanding digital tools time and time again. We've felt it at work and of course at home, not least uh, in the COVID years, as computers and the internet gradually empowered our lives. And we felt uh, also uh, when there was a clearer understanding of social media and as we started comprehending the privacy issues that are inherent to uh, those tools. We felt it uh, back in the last decade uh, uh, with Cambridge Analytica, which really was a wake-up call. Uh, and with the new generative AI boom, we've of course only seen these challenges becoming more pressing. It's not going to slow down. Uh, we share your sense of uh, urgency at the European Commission. People indeed need to be equipped to address the risks uh, and to take advantage of the opportunities that digital uh, offers to us. And these challenges have of course been on the agenda for, for some time. We've set some concrete targets uh, to achieve uh, on digital skills. We want to achieve that at least 80% uh, of people in the EU are equipped with basic digital skills by 2030. We want to have 20 million ICT specialists by the same year with more women uh, in the sector. And we want to reduce the percentage of eight graders underachieving, underachieving in computer and information literacy to no more than 50%, 15% as part of our European education area in the making. And yet, if we look at where we stand, we can see that there is a real reason for this sense of urgency, because currently only 54% of Europe's citizens have basic digital skills. Huh? Uh, in addition to, I mean, we call it the fourth uh, basic skill. Uh, in addition to uh, the literacy, the numeracy, and the science skills. And more than a third of Europe's workers lack the digital skills required in most jobs. Today we have just 9 million ICT specialists, and only one out of five is a woman. And a whopping 34% of eighth graders underachieve in computer and information literacy. So these targets are indeed central for Europe, both uh, our competitiveness 
and our democracy depends on a skilled labor force. And we have to make sure that digital transformation leaves no one in our communities behind. And that means ensuring that every young person has the right to develop digital skills at school, all while reinforcing our capacity to upskill and reskill adults. This idea that equity and skilled labor force must go hand in hand is a clear message that we've been pus pushing throughout the European Year of Skills. So yes, the time is now, but we are not starting from scratch. Our Digital Education Action Plan outlines a long-term vision of high quality and inclusive education. Indeed, you referred to it, David. We proposed two council recommendations in April last year, one for effective and inclusive digital education and another for improving the provision of digital skills. And they were indeed adopted by the EU Council last November. And this was an important political milestone. The member states made an unprecedented commitment to take digital education further so that education systems do ramp up their efforts to address the digital skills needed in our society and economy. Because this is fundamental for the scale of our response so that we can have greater impact, leaving no learner behind. At the same time, both these recommendations recognize the need to engage all stakeholders. They highlight the need for a more coherent framework of investment, governance, and capacity building. Again, this is fundamental for scale. We need everyone's coordinated help, and we need resources to fuel it. So these council recommendations indeed send an important message across the EU's education systems. School, schools are a fundamental place where digital skills are developed. More specifically, we suggest to consider informatics as a core part of curricula. Why? Because informatics help us understand the laws of the digital world, just like physics and maths explain those of the physical world. So let's take artificial intelligence, including generative AI. We put forward our ethical guidelines on the use of artificial intelligence and data in teaching and learning in 2022. And since then, we all saw how AI rapidly proliferated and found its way in many sectors, including education. And in order to understand what AI is, how it can be used, how it should not be used, uh, teachers and learners, they need a solid understanding of how algorithms operate, how data is collected, how it's used in AI models and in systems. And in addition to that work, we recommend that these skills are not only developed and nurtured, but that they are also assessed and ultimately ideally certified. Assessments help students demonstrate what they have learned, it helps teachers evaluate the performance of students, and it ultimately helps us all to be more accountable. These recommendations, along with the reforms they support in our member states, they need fuel, they need funding, and the funding comes from our EU programs. And digital is, as I said in the beginning, one of our cross-cutting priorities in our flagship program for education and training, Erasmus+. Plus. Indeed, Erasmus+, Plus is instrumental for the implementation of the Digital Education Action Plan. It supports projects across borders. It supports the e-twinning network it supports teachers as they build skills, for example, through the Erasmus Plus teacher academies. And we, I could go on with a long list. And at the same time, digital education and skills feature strongly in many other programs. Digital Europe, for example, with an emphasis on advanced digital skills, or Horizon Europe, 
supporting innovation. Supported by Horizon precisely, we have the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, which connects our innovation communities to learners that want to add their efforts to tackle these challenges. And of course, we cannot forget the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which foresees 25.7 billion euro for di digital skills, along with the European Social Fund Plus, which has so far developed, uh, sorry, devoted 2 billion uh, euro for the same purpose. And these funds help us not only find good practices, but support the uptake uh, across the EU. They empower many people directly or indirectly. Yet this action, both bottom up through the projects and top down through system wide support to our member states, requires a system wide coordinated approach. And that is where discussions like uh, the one we are having here today uh, are essential. Because precisely because we have uh, substantial challenges ahead, because we are not starting from scratch, and because we need to see where we are, what is left from multiple points of view uh, across the whole sector. Events like this Digital Skills Summit provides us a fundamental forum to assess, to listen, and to keep working in a joined up way. <clears throat> and ultimately, uh, enhancing competitiveness, keeping our democracies strong is also very much what this endeavor is about. So thank you very much once again for organizing the event. I look forward to listening and learning from you and to uh, interesting discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much and for the meaningful reminder that both democracy and competitiveness are at stake here. Let's move on. We have a fantastic speaker after yeah, Mr. Hadi Partovi, founder of... Do you want to present from here or from... Uh, I can go up there, but I need the clicker that's... It's here. there. Good. Oh. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you for hosting me. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, I was told uh, that uh, it would be helpful for me to talk about the ways that Code.org has achieved the success that it's had both in the United States and in our global efforts. Uh, I usually repeat the same slides in every presentation I give. These are completely new slides that I created just this morning, and I wanted to thank uh, the folks in the back of the room who helped with the technical getting the slides ready for this presentation on very, very short notice. Um, I start all my presentations with a personal story and a personal quote that motivated the work of Code.org. When Code.org launched, uh, we launched with a video with a quote from Steve Jobs that said, everybody should learn to program a computer because it teaches you how to think. <coughs> but I actually have a different quote from Steve Jobs that is more motivational to me and inspires the work I do, and I think it inspires the work of everybody who works in education. He said once that every child, when it's born, as it grows up, is used to a world that is a fixed world and is told, don't try to change anything, don't pat bash into the walls, the world is as it is, and you should expect it to stay that way. And then everything changes when a child learns one thing, that everything around you was created by other people, no different than yourself. And then once you learn that, you realize you can change the world, you can influence things, you can create things. And that opens a doorway to opportunity and unleashing human potential. And really, the work at Code.org, my work and the work of anybody in education is about helping unleash human potential, helping children recognize their ability to influence and change the world and create. This relates to my own personal story. Uh, this is a photo of myself and my identical twin brother when we were growing up. Uh, we grew up in Tehran, Iran. A few years after this photo was taken, our country broke into an Islamic revolution and a war with the neighboring country of Iraq. Uh, it was a very tough time to be a, a tough place to grow up. You know, I spent my days in fear of the morality police. My evenings were spent in the basement while our, our neighborhood was getting bombed. Uh, but my life changed dramatically when my parents gave my brother and I a magical gift. 
Uh, they gave us a Commodore 64 computer, uh, but this actually wasn't the magical gift because it had no software and no apps, and we, you couldn't purchase apps for a Commodore 64 in Tehran, Iran at that time. The magical gift was a book, an introduction to basic programming. And so they're stuck in an environment of war and revolution. I basically learned everything I could from this book and became very good at, at computer programming. And so when I came to the United States as a young immigrant, my family was poor. We were learning a new culture and language, trying to fit in. Uh, we didn't, couldn't even afford a home. Uh, but what I had to my name was an extremely good understanding of computer programming. And that led me down a pathway of starting to intern at tech companies before I was even legal to work, uh, uh, going to the best school, studying computer science, and a great career in technology, and now creating Code.org and, and having an impact globally on computer science education. And so my story, like the Steve Jobs quote, is a story of unleashing human potential and finding that moment that helps a student recognize that they can change and create things. Uh, so, Instead of talking about why teach computer science, which is what I usually talk about, I think this uh, room is already convinced about that. Uh, and I've been asked to talk about how we succeeded, the scale code.org has, has succeeded. I want to start with a few numbers just to talk about code.org's impact uh, after 10 years of the work that we've been doing. Uh, so in the United States, we've changed 300 policies across all 50 states. Uh, Internationally, we've had 80 countries announce some sort of plan for computer science. We've had uh, 100,000 teachers trained just in the United States to begin teaching computer science. 80 million registered students on our platform. Uh, these aren't just in the United States, they're roughly 50% of the US, roughly 50% uh, outside the US. Uh, 250 million projects created by students on our platform. And lastly, the Hour of Code, this global campaign we started to introduce students in classrooms to just one hour of computer science has now reached 1.7 billion student engagements. Uh, that's more than there are students <laughs> in the world, uh, which means lots of students have been doing this multiple times uh, or multiple years in a row. Uh, these are the most important measures of our impact. Uh, in the United States, there's a exam much like the International Baccalaureate for Computer Science and that has also been the fastest growing uh, exam and course in the United States for the last 10 years. It's more than 10 times growth in the last 10 years. Very, very few things in education grow 10 times, uh, but computer science uh, exams in the, in the advanced placement exam is one of those things. Um, this is an incredible amount of success and wouldn't have been possible by my work alone or my team of 100 uh, working alone. It's been thanks to a very, very large group of folks that we've managed to get behind one idea. Uh, but what I want to talk about is the specific strategies that helped us get here. Uh, so Code.org has a relatively unique strategy compared to education nonprofits. I'm not aware of anybody else who has done all the pieces of what we do. Uh, and our strategy involves four parts. I describe them and you know, I shape them in a puzzle because each of these parts helps the other. One part, and the most important, is inspiration and celebration. The second part is creating or taking advantage of a superb free learning platform. The third part is working in schools to actually implement computer science programs. And the fourth part is changing the system at the policy level. These are described as puzzle pieces because every one of them helps the other one. The work we do to inspire and spread the word drives usage of our learning platform. The more people use our learning platform, we use the data from that to, in, to advocate at the policy level with government officials. Government officials provide funding which help us uh, do the in-school implementation work. And then the students in our schools provide great videos that we then feed back into inspiration and celebration. So this, uh, all of these things work together. And because we do all these things, uh, we've become the number one at all four of them in the space of computer science education. I want to talk about each of them individually. So the first part, inspiration and celebration, is by far the most important. Uh, Socrates once said that education isn't the filling of a vessel, it's the kindling of a flame. Uh, uh, the poet Yeats also said something very similar, that education isn't about pouring water into a bucket, it's about lighting a fire. Inspiring students to learn is the most important thing to actually lead them on the pathway to education. In fact, in today's age, 
it's more important than ever because 200 years ago, the only way you could learn is listening to your teacher. And then you could start reading books. Nowadays, you have YouTube, you have the internet. There's so many different ways that students can learn. It's that inspiration that is the most important part. And an inspired student will do a lot more. For this work, inspiring students isn't the only part that's important. Inspiring adults, teachers, policymakers, everybody needs to be inspired to change the education system. Education doesn't change quickly. It doesn't change on a term of a dime. In fact, it usually doesn't change at all. And so people don't think about, oh, it's time to change things. They think we shouldn't change it. I learned it this way. We should teach it the, the way I learned it. So it takes a lot of effort to inspire people to change. And that's where we put the, the biggest amount of our effort. Um, one of the things we've used is taking advantage of role models and celebrities and influencers, athletes, actresses, ideally folks with global reach. These are just a few examples of, the, of folks that have endorsed uh, this work. And when we recruit these folks, we don't recruit them to endorse code.org. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure any of them has endorsed code.org. It's to recruit them to endorse computer science, to endorse the idea that every student in every school should have the opportunity to learn computer science. And this message resonates. It's nonpartisan. It's something that anybody can get behind. And we've spent a lot of effort getting really important, famous people to endorse it and then to engage with students. Uh, we've also worked hard to get world leaders to not only talk about this message, but to actually write code. Uh, of these, the hardest was getting Pope Francis to <laughs> write one line of code. Uh, and in fact, five minutes before we went on stage to do it, his handler alerted me that his fingers don't work on iPads. They've tried and it doesn't work and I need a backup plan. Uh, fortunately, we actually had one of those girls literally uh, move the Pope's hand to make sure that it touched the iPad in the right way. Uh, but getting you know, queens and kings and prime ministers and presidents and the Pope to engage in computer science, aside from celebrities, has been one way of inspiring people that computer science is important. Now, when doing this work, one thing that's critical is testing and using messaging that aligns and resonates with the particular audience. Different audiences care about different messages. Uh, now think about different audiences like policymakers, teaching administrators, classroom teachers, parents, and students. And as I shared these different messages, think about which of them works, which message works better for what audience. Economic growth. Not as interesting for the student, much more interesting for a politician. And I'm mentioning this because there's lots of reasons to teach computer science. It's important to think about what you're messaging to whom. Uh, the opportunities, creating opportunities for careers for underserved populations or impacting workplace diversity. Creating foundational learning opportunities for all students because computer science is foundational in the 21st century. Bringing creativity into the classroom, <laughs> helping students create things. Uh, learning that with computer science you can change the world that it's easier than you think, and lastly, that it's fun. All of these are reasons to teach computer science. Some of them are reasons that a student would be much more excited about. Some of them are things that an educator would be more excited about. Some of them are things that politicians would be more excited about. All of these messages resonate with different people. And so when we put out communications, we think very carefully about who we're messaging to and what message are we saying, and then leveraging celebrity talent, students, tech leaders, et cetera, to get that message across. Uh, Code.org is probably best known for the videos we create. I'm gonna play just one example of a video, uh, and I'm not sure how to play this. I'm gonna ask, me. Oh, there we go. And this is an example of how we craft our messaging. So what grade are you in? Second. 10th grade? First grade. I was in eighth grade when I learned to program. I got my first computer when I was in sixth grade. What gets me excited is being able to fix people's problems. You can express yourself. You can build things from an idea. Computer science is the basis for a lot of the things that college students and professionals will do for the next 20 or 30 years. I like programming because I like helping people. I get the opportunity to build something that's going to make people's life easier. I think it's the closest thing we have to a superpower. Getting started is the most important part. So I hope I'm a beginner myself, and I want you to learn with me.
This is an example of a student focused video in case it's not obvious. It doesn't talk about economic growth or you know, the, the future of our country's development plans. It's more about getting students engaged. Uh, I also want to say that when we produce videos, just producing a video isn't enough. Putting it out on the internet doesn't make it go viral. It takes extra effort to make sure you to line up hundreds of people or organizations with large followings to retweet or share the video to make sure it goes viral. Uh, and that's something we repeatedly have done as a, as a process to basically drive videos to go viral. There's a fallacy that you could just put a celebrity in a video and it's going to get lots of eyeballs. It takes a lot of effort to make things get seen. Uh, besides creating viral videos, a huge part of effort, our effort is partnerships that actually move the needle towards reaching teachers. Now, on the right hand side, I have a sea of logos. That's actually not the thing that moves the needle. <laughs> Having a page with lots of logos doesn't impact anybody. It makes people look at your website and say, oh, great, lots of people are helping you. But what really matters is, are they actually helping you? And what are they doing? And does it reach teachers? Uh, so it's of these sets of logos, some of them have helped code.org a lot. Some of them have helped us a little bit, but we owe them some favor for something, so their <laughs> logos on our website. But let me give you examples of things that really move the needle. Uh, when we started the Hour of Code, we were a seven or eight person organization and we wanted to get uh, 100,000 classrooms to do the Hour of Code. So we got Khan Academy, Donors Choose, the, in America the National uh, Society of STEM Teachers, uh, the, the College Board, all organizations that individually reached millions of teachers to all email every teacher on their mailing list saying the Hour of Code is coming. And we were a brand new organization. I'm not sure why or how we got all these much larger organizations to, to utilize their mailing list. But every teacher in America heard at least twice or three times that the Hour of Code is coming. And they're like, what is the Hour of Code? Uh, and once they kept hearing about it from multiple places, they looked into it. Uh, and that, these are examples of partnerships that actually reach teachers. When we launched the Hour of Code, it was with a speech by President Obama with uh, the Google and Microsoft homepages promoting it, every single Apple store offering an hour of code in their Apple stores. These are things that directly reach people, uh, much, much more than just putting logos on a website. Uh, and what I want to mention is that the work of inspiration and celebration truly involves building a movement. Uh, if you want to do this work, it's not easy, it's not small, you need to think very big and try to get a lot of effort behind it. Uh, most work in education is a little bit sort of just policy oriented and sort of people looking inside a book and figuring out if they write a better idea, it'll happen. But trying to get actual people to care, especially teachers, millions of teachers to care about change requires movement building and putting a lot of unique, passionate effort. Now. Uh, just building the movement and inspiring isn't enough. That's just the first part, but it's the most important part. The second part of our work has been to create a superb, free and open source learning platform. Uh, ours isn't the only one, and there's been uh, lots of people who've created similar platforms inspired by our work. Uh, so I don't want to say that this is the only way you could do it is with the code.org platform. But some of the things that make our, our platform unique is first of all, kids engage with brands or figures that they love, whether it's music that they love or games that they love or characters from movies that they love. That said, this isn't the most important part. The most important part is the creativity. And in fact, one of our most popular tutorials called Flappy Bird lets you create a Flappy Bird game with a, with a bird that is not famous. With, you know, Flappy Bird is not a, a licensed important thing from Disney or from some famous video game or movie. Uh, it's just a very graphically unappealing bird and you move it around, uh, but it's fun for kids because they get to choose the rules of the game. Creativity is the most important drive for students to learn computer science, more important than economic development and etc. Um, for our platform, the things that have made it successful, the first has been a laser focus on the student experience, having the fastest path to creating, to experiencing creativity to make things for students feel more like a game than like homework. Uh, and then for the teachers, lowering the barriers so that you don't need to install software to begin coding. Uh, even logging in is optional. Just go to this web page and it works. Uh, 
making it work on any browser or tablet, and again, to reduce the number of IT hassles, and coming soon, making it work even if you don't have an internet connection or if you don't have a computer. These are the things that remove the barriers to access at the bottom half, but the stuff in the top half is what gets students excited. Student excitement is probably the number one engine of growth for Code.org, because teachers put it in the classroom, they see that students love it, and then they tell other teachers, you should check this thing out. My kids are learning to code and they're enjoying it. Uh, and the reason students enjoy it is the creativity, that by third grade they can start creating beautiful art, and along the way they're learning about mathematics and angles. By middle school, instead of playing games on their phone, they can create games, and by high school they can create more advanced apps. Creativity is one of the most important motivations of all humans, especially students, and it's lacking in most education. The third part of our strategy is the in-school implementation. After doing the inspiration and creating a great platform, school by school by school, making sure schools are actually teaching computer science. The unit of change for this is getting a teacher to be willing to teach computer science and going through a professional development program and training so that they feel equipped to actually teach a course. We don't have, nobody has enough money to hire computer scientists to become teachers. That's impossible. But we don't need computer scientists to be teachers, just like we don't need surgeons to teach biology. We need teachers to teach it. And the training to do that is not that hard because we're not training teachers to become computer science. We're training them to facilitate an inquiry-based training teaching strategy with a course that's designed for the teacher to be a lead learner and a facilitator. So the first part of the, the training is to tell the teacher that you're gonna stand up in front of the class and tell your students that I'm learning with you. I'm learning a course that, I'm teaching a course that I've never learned when I was your age, so we're gonna learn this together. And that's a very disarming thing for a teacher to say, but it's important because the teachers themselves are intimidated. Most teachers don't think I can teach computer science. They think I can't teach computer science. And we tell them, use that as a strength. Admit that to your students. The students will actually be encouraged to try and help you learn because they think, oh, the adult is also learning with us. And it actually also shows the importance of lifelong learning. We use a train-the-trainer model. In the United States, we have about 1,000 facilitators who deliver trainings with 60 different partners who are working in different regions. Uh, we work very hard to get the cost down to the level of roughly $2,000 to train a secondary school teacher. And we also use data dashboards so our partners know how to reach teachers uh, in different regions where computer science is needed. Honey, can I ask you a favor? Yes. Sorry. Uh, Valeria Iona has been called to the Prime Minister in 10 minutes. Can we stop here and sure. come back after Valeria to finish yes. the presentation? This is super important and we don't want to miss it, but I don't want to miss Valeria. All right. so thank you very much. Sorry about that. And uh, uh, we, we already know of what you've been presenting. It's amazing. But it's just that we want to have Valeria Yonan, Deputy Minister of Ukraine, who has been called to the Prime Minister, and she has only 10 minutes. So if we can connect her, please. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, first of all. Dear colleagues, David, do you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Hi, Valeria. So nice to see you. Yes. Yes, we can hear you very well. And really so sorry for this delay and sorry that I could not be there with you offline and very grateful for all your um, support and efforts and for the invitation and for the possibility to be here and kudos for the previous speaker uh, to go to work. We are really, really excited and very happy of our partnership with Go to Work. Uh, we have translated with the support of, of the Kudo team, uh, part of a uh, big part of lessons in the Ukrainian that it's, they are also available for Ukrainian students. So thank you very much for that. And since I have only 10 minutes, I will really try to briefly um, tell you a little bit more about what we are doing in Ukraine with digital transformation. And as you know, uh, basically our vision is to build the most convenient digital state in the world. Ukraine has been called the European Digital Transformation Tiger. And Ukraine is also the first country in the world where digital passports are totally equivalent to paper or plastic ones. So, uh, we actually have created an ecosystem of digital projects, which is called DIA. Uh, first of all, our core product is mobile application DIA, which is used by 20 million users. Uh, it has 40 digital documents available in smartphones, 30 digital services, and digital segments. What? 
and also we have a lot of other projects in the ecosystem like state portal public services dia dia business a national project of the development of smes dia engine which is a low code platform for creating state registries and state services and of course dia education a national edutainment platform for reskilling and digital literacy and I would really love to give you a little bit more of understanding, uh, especially about our project DIA Education. So you remember our vision to build the most competitive digital state in the world, and it, is, it will be just simply not possible if uh, Ukrainians will have low digital skills. So since uh, the beginning uh, of work in our ministry, since 2019, we started to conduct um, I would say regular researches. And the first research on digital literacy in Ukraine showed us that 82% of Ukrainians had low digital skills, meaning 47 had basic digital skills or above. By the way, you have a QR code here for the English version of research in case you are interested. So in order actually to change this situation, we have created a project which was called DIA Digital Education. It was a platform with um, edutainment series on digital literacy devoted to different segments of target audience, starting from scholars and ending up with people of elegant age. So there, there were like micro learning uh, lessons, stock lessons, and the possibility to uh, use different tests like digigrams to test digital skills. By the way, DigiGrams are made uh, upon a DigiCom 2.1 and 2.2 frameworks. But of course, as you know, um, in uh, February 2022, the full-scale Russian invasion to Ukraine started, and um, unfortunately, it has brought a lot of challenges in different spheres, in, 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 and of course, in economic front and in, in educational front. And speaking about, I would say, economic front, we, we have seen that a lot of to change their regions, they had actually to relocate, um, and uh, because of that, we have seen a high level of employment of unemployment in Ukraine. So, a lot of internally displaced people actually do not have work, and we understood that we have to do something with that, and that's why uh, actually last year, with the support of Google Org, we have made a relaunch of our platform. And we have completely restored the way of um, educational process, as well as of content and of different user flows. So today, DIA Education is a national entertainment platform for reskilling of digital literacy, which has different sections. First of all, there is the possibility to create personalized learning trajectory. So by choosing the skills that you would like to learn, the system will show you the list of different episodes from different series, which you could use to create your own educational series. Secondly, of course, and you can, if you are looking for a job, you can pass the career guided test, receive recommendations on those professions that might suit you. Then you can actually choose one of those professions. You can watch the educational series, which is done in entertainment format. You can pass through interactive simulator. Then you receive a certificate, and then uh, you can see all open job offers in your region. So we actually have integrated our platform with biggest job platforms in Ukraine, and in that way, we always have um, the up-to-date information about open uh, job vacancies in concrete region. So another way, there is also separate uh, content blocks, like, um, for example, webinars, podcasts, and guides. So actually, every person who would like to reskill, who would like to upskill, who would like to just improve their level of digital skills, uh, they could find this uh, information on the uh, on the DA education uh, platform. Today we have two million registered users. This quantity is growing uh, all the time. Also, we have uh, like before the Russian invasion, we had five uh, thousand uh, digital hubs, which were located in libraries, universities, and schools. So these are basically places where people can get access to the internet and to the gadget. And where is a facilitator who could facilitate the first content of a person with a gadget and explain how the platform is working for you and how to receive some digital services. Today we also have 75% of success rate, which is great. So basically by the success rate, we mean the quantity of uh, users who uh, receive certificates uh, generally on our platform for different courses. 
Um, also, uh, I would like to share with you uh, with you some of the results. <laughs> so here is the logic of of Ukrainians who have uh, digital skills on basic or uh, upper level. So if in 2019 we had 47 percent of those, today in 2023 we have 59.6. So actually we have the growth of 12.6 percent improvement of digital skills in four years. So these are three different researches which were conducted um, in, in different uh, time. There is an access to all English versions just in case you're interested. We were using the DESI methodology for that. I personally believe that this is a really good result and taking into consideration the digital decade goals uh, where there is a goal to uh, have 18% um, of Europeans should have digital skills at least on a basic level till 2030. I believe in Ukraine we could do it even faster. Maybe in two or three years. At least we'll try to do it. And also last year we have started a new project from media education, which is the updated computer science. We call it IT Studios. And we launched it in autumn. Uh, today already 1,400 schools are connected. So basically it's a separate module on the platform uh, with interactive tasks, with different interfaces for scholars, for teachers, and for parents. Um, the content is based also on mindful learning from modules and different topics. It is very convenient um, interface, very user-friendly interface for different, um, for, for different users. There is a lot of different functions like analytics, um, analytics uh, and profile for every scholar, for every group. There is a lot of different functions for the teacher to make the educational process more personalized. And um, we are even working all the time to improve it, to, to improve it. There is a lot of links to third-party content as well, for example, to code work, which we really love to, to use and to believe that that's really a great platform and a great uh, project uh, for, for scholars, and not only. And of course, we have a new project, which is the national uh, program on the promotion of English language, which is called Future Perfect. And we have a separate uh, section on the education uh, about this uh, project. Um, we are also uh, working on a law uh, to make in, to, to give a special status uh, for English language in Ukraine, and hopefully this year uh, this uh, law will be voted in the Congress. And also, uh, there are lots of other projects which we are doing together with our partners to promote English uh, in Ukraine. And the last but not the least, and I know I know that this is probably too much <laughs> for ten minutes of speech. But I cannot mention this. Um, as you know, DIA right now is our like state secret for digital services, it's our core product. But we are also working on something new, something even bigger. And um, I'm really glad to announce uh, probably the, the most innovative educational governmental app in the world, which will be called Bria. Uh, it means a dream. So Bria will be a fully educational app which will cover all of these stages from kindergarten and up to uh, people of elegant age and uh, depending on the, the user profile will be fully personalized uh, will be built on AI will create personalized learning prejudice uh, will also suggest uh, depending on analytical data on the user profile both suggest some recommendations so let's say you are a scholar and you are very good at math, but then the system will suggest you maybe to uh, listen for a course on entrepreneurship and then to get a grant and who send you the link where you can apply. So uh, with the analytical data which will be available, it will be easier for a person to create his, his own professional path. Well, the government is also great because we actually will see the files on how schools are uh, functioning how they are operating, um, whether everyone is satisfied with the uh, teachers, with the school management, with the, with the content, etc. So, uh, spoiler, Brina uh, will be launched in April this year. It will be an MVP of an app. It will be developed by iterations, but the first version will be already available this year. And this is something new which we are working on right now. So, with that, I would like to say that Ukraine is very open for partnerships, for sharing experience, and we are very grateful for your support and for standing with Ukraine.
Here are my contacts, and I will be glad to stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Valeria, thank you so much. You know, uh, we admire you so much, your bravery and Maybe your profit. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Well, we admire you a lot. We admire you because you are brave and because you are very capable. I don't know what you are more. And uh, you're also a very nice person. It's, a, it's an honor to, to work with you. And we look forward to hosting you in Brussels for Launch in Maria. Okay? Thank you so much, David. And dear colleagues, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So now uh, Hadi will go back to speak, and I promise in the video we will cut this and put it together smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely my first time stopping a speech to <laughs> pause and come back. Back to your previous programming. Um, I was talking about the four parts of the code.org strategy, inspiration, making a fantastic learning platform, school by school implementation, and then last, the last part for us is the policy work to change the system. And I list this last because uh, we actually didn't start by saying, let's start changing the laws and then telling everybody how to do education differently. We actually went by starting with the inspiration work, creating a platform, training teachers, and then going to the government officials saying, look at all this stuff that's happening. You really should support laws that, that support what's already happening in the schools. We basically built this as a ground up movement by teachers and then went to the politicians and said, this is already happening. Shouldn't it be in every school? Look at all the schools that are already doing it. Uh, we have 10 different policy recommendations within the United States. These may or may not apply to different countries in the EU. Uh, the first, I'm gonna highlight four that are the most important. One is defining what is computer science because people get confused between computer science and digital skills and computer purchasing. Uh, you know, lots of places would say, oh yeah, we do computer science, we just bought iPads. And we're like, that's not computer science. Or we teach PowerPoint and typing and Microsoft Word. And again, that's not computer science. Defining what it actually is is one of the most important policy things to do. Uh, the second very important one is allocating government funding for teacher training. Uh, the cost of creating a coding platform is much less than the cost of training hundreds of thousands of teachers, and that's the unit of change. Uh, at code.org, we spend a lot of our money on basically training teachers, but uh, more than half of the money for the training of teachers in the United States has come from government funding. Uh, the third policy that we push for is that uh, school systems should require that every school must teach computer science and then provide a timeline and then say that every school in this state must offer it. And then the last one that's most important is the, the penultimate strategy is to say this is compulsory for every student. You can't graduate high school unless you take computer science. Uh, and in terms of those uh, four uh, things, just to tell you, this first one, which is defining computer science, has now been done in all 50 states. The second one, which is allocating funding for computer science, is in about 35 of the US states. Requiring every school must teach computer science is in 27 states. And then requiring every student must take it to graduation, to graduate high school. We only just started this and is now in eight states. But it's, uh, you know, our goal across these 10 policies is to get all of them in all 50 states. Uh, so there's, 10 times 50 states, there's 500 laws we need to change. Uh, we've done 300, we have 200 left to go. Um, in terms of driving policy change, one of the most critical things that helps us is using data. Uh, for example, we have a map on the code.org website where you can click on any state and see that, you know, for example, in Illinois, right now, this month, uh, and this is a screenshot from this morning, there's 14,160 open jobs in computing, but only 2,900 students graduating from Illinois universities with computer science backgrounds. And then you can see the stats on the individual policies, and we even have a state-by-state -state fact sheet which then has three pages of data just about the state of Illinois, including how many students are learning on code.org, how many teachers are teaching with it, 
How many of them are young women? How many are black? How many are Latino? You know, what is their success rate on the advanced placement exam? Politicians like good messages, but ultimately they also need to know that the data supports the policy. And we use lots and lots of data to show not just what's working, but also what other states are doing. These are what the other states have done and how they've advanced. I now finished talking about all four parts of the strategy, but I just want to repeat that doing this work is not easy. It's not just like you do a little thing and then it's done. Caring about the ultimate outcome is the hardest part. Uh, the other thing I'd want to say is the work of teaching computer science is changing tremendously because of the advent of generative AI. Generative AI is not like any of the previous uh, technological advancements. It is, turning, it is going to turn all of education upside down. And within that, computer science has an opportunity to lead in what that evolution means. As, as we were hearing earlier, it's critical as part of embracing AI in classrooms to teach how AI works, to teach what the algorithms are, to teach how training data can impact bias and create unsafe circumstances. Uh, something we've launched is a, a global consortium to help school systems learn how to teach with AI and how to teach about AI. But for folks who care about computer science, the, the AI revolution is an opportunity to increase the importance of teaching computer science in classrooms. Uh, AI is a superpower, uh, but it's only available to, for, to people who know how to use it. Uh, and you know, people have a lot of fear about AI, but one of the messages I repeatedly say is that AI isn't gonna take people's jobs. Somebody who knows how to use AI is going to take people's jobs. And so it's the, the goal of our education system is to teach people how to use AI because those are going to be the people who will have employment in the future. Um, I want to close by saying the work that we've done at Code.org has not been my work alone or the work of my team, but it's really thanks to millions of teachers who have embraced this work. Uh, and as I return to my own personal story, when I came to the United States, uh, my family had literally nothing. We, we couldn't afford a home. Uh, you know, we were, the clothes I was wearing were clothes that we were borrowing from other people who had finished wearing them and then I got to wear them once they'd been fully used. Uh, I was learning a new language, learning a new culture, but my background in computer science helped me build a very, very successful career. And if you think about today's children, especially the poorest children, the children in the most uh, underserved regions, whether it's in Ukraine or even in places like Gaza, and you think about the school systems and what are those children learning, if there's one skill you could teach them, in the 21st century that sets them up for success. Besides reading and writing, which is very basic, it is computer science. But most schools don't teach computer science, and it's our job collectively to get us there. I want to close with a short message by Code.org students. The world has some big problems, but I'm little, what can I do? Even when problems seem big, we can tackle them one step at a time. Our generation can help make a more prosperous, equitable, and sustainable world. I'm learning to code. I'm designing apps that solve local problems. I'm programming robots. I'm learning computer science to make change happen. Because with technology, we can build robots to clean world's oceans. We can program drones to detect forest fires quickly. We can empower young women with digital skills and tools. We can program mobile apps to streamline farming in poor rural areas. We can use gene sequencing to diagnose diseases. And create personalized medicine to cure them. I'm little, but don't look at my size. Look at my potential. I can make change happen. 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 Thank you very much. Wow, okay, thank you so much, Adi. It was really special, and uh, I think for everyone in the room is, is very excited from thank here. You. But of course, a lot is happening in Europe also, and has happened over the last year, and we are lucky enough to have with us Enrico. Enrico, I don't know if you want to stand or... Uh, Enrico Nardelli has been one of the animators and advocates making change happen in Europe, in Italy former president of Informatics Europe and professor at the University of Torrico. Enrico, thank you for being with us. Okay, so thanks. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, okay, so thanks to the Lisbon Council for having organized this summit and having invited me and thanks to all of you for uh, being here. So I'll start with uh, an historical perspective. I'm a university professor, so I will be a, more academic, a bit more academic than, than Hadi. Um, so in, in, in the beginning of our journey as human race towards the goal of making sense of the world around us, we expressed our knowledge using a natural language. We lived mainly in an agricultural society with very little technology. And even the more complex and wonderful artifacts, like for example the, the Roman bridges or the Gothic cathedral, were built mostly on the basics of empi empirical rules. So we didn't, re didn't really need much more than our natural language. Then we started understanding that uh, if we want to reason in a precise quantitative way about the world, then the natural language is not the best tool. We need a more expressive language that is mathematics. Consider this question. If a cake is one kilo, how much is three quarters of two thirds of it? Which is inspired by a famous miniature poem by Pete Hine. Using words is not immediate to provide the answer. But the same problem, formulated mathematically, is much easier to solve. And you can see by yourself the passages and the answer is half a kilo. <coughs> so from the Renaissance onwards, our journey toward a deeper and more exact understanding of the world around us has been based on the language of mathematics, without which no technology can be reliably developed and replicated. Society, society gradually changed from agricultural to industrial and now to a digital. And one could then ask, isn't mathematics enough to, ed to educate citizens to understand the digital world? The answer is no. And I'll bring you some testimonials. Scientists much better known than myself. So already 60 years ago, Peter Naur here in Europe and George Forsyth in the United States stressed the fact that natural language, mathematics, and informatics are three fundamental languages to be mastered by every citizen. Actually, George Forsyth wrote about computer science, which is the American name for, in, for informatics. Then, 20 years ago, Bernard Chazelle wrote that informatics will play in the 21st century the same role mathematics has played in the 20th century. We have disciplines whose object of study are not passive entities, like a storm or a hurricane, but reactive ones like an organism looking for food and avoiding dangers and deciding about which course of action to follow. For these disciplines, a language based on nouns like mathematics is not the best one. One needs a language based on verbs like informatics, which allow to express how to process information and how to act consequently. These insights have been made by Bruno Frey and Brian Arthur. Of course, what I've just described does not imply that we can dispense from mathematics. It, it's only that we need both mathematics and informatics. But there is much more. I have recalled the transition from agricultural society to an industrial one. This transition was prepared by the printing press, the invention of printing press by Gutenberg in the 15th century, which I call the first revolution in terms of power relations, since it altered the power relation between a master and its student. After the printing press revolution, if one wants to learn, can just read printed books and does not need to be in the place where the master is teaching. So this is an altering of authority. The second revolution of power relations happened with the introduction of industrial machine which boosted the physical capabilities of human being, altering the power relation between mankind and nature. We can build ships, planes, cars, overcoming our physical limitation, and a single person can do the works of tens and hundreds. Industrial machines are amplifiers of our physical strength. The third revolution is the informatics revolution, which is also the title of my book, where I have described this conceptual framework, 
And the power relation which is being changed is the one between machines and mankind. The machines built by the informatic revolution, that is computers, are what I've called the cognitive machines, since they are able, using logic rules, to mechanically relate, concatenate, and process information to derive new information. Just one example of this, from the set of distances between neighboring cities, cognitive machines can compute the best path between any two cities, something that we use every day. Until before the informatic revolution, no machine had this kind of capability in general. So cognitive machines are amplifiers of our rational cognitive capabilities. They are to our rational brain what industrial machines our, to our, are to our physical body. They are challenging our intellectual supremacy. The power of cognitive machines has now became, became evident to the eyes of everybody with the latest powerful generation of them, the one based on artificial intelligence. Their advent is similar to the advent of electricity in the context of industrial revolution. Before electricity, industrial machines were large, heavy, <coughs> confined mostly to factories, and required specialized knowledge to be operated. With electricity, their power was brought to each, into each household, where one can have a washing machine or a food processor just at the touch of a button. AI can bring the power of cognitive machines to everybody. And that's why we have an absolute need of educating all citizens in the third fundamental language, informatics, so that they can, they can add to their capability of comprehension one more dimension. It will be like passing <coughs> from a flat two-dimensional world to a depth-rich three-dimensional one. So which are the key elements of any educational strategy on such a big topic. I have identified five of them. First, already been said, prepare, the, prepare teachers. Any other technical revolution happened uh, and became universal across many generations. Informatics revolution only required 20 years. Just think to 2004. No smartphone, no internet, no, not no internet, but no social network. So it, a completely different world. Most of teachers have been educated in a world without informatics. They cannot just load the cartridge into their brain like they do in the Matrix movie and be prepared to educate the children. Without well-prepared te prepared teachers, our educational efforts will fail. Second, starts early in school. Informatics at its core is as abstract as mathematics and like mathematics, children have to start working on it very early and avoiding an excess of technology to allow their brain to gradually absorb abstract concepts. Third, go slowly. Again, math is an example to follow. For the first seven, eight years, uh, in primary and lower secondary, pupils uh, more or less just study arithmetics and elementary geometry. So there is no need of teaching every detail of a programming language when teaching informatics in school. On these issues, the <coughs> national project I am coordinating and charging off in Italy, Programma il Futuro, is doing a really great job thanks to the very good materials provided by Code.org. And I can uh, ask you to trust Adi, everything he has said about the wonderful platform is true. We have been using it since 10 years and it's, it's working wonderfully. Fourth, pay attention to gender diversity in teaching. On the field research done on teaching science in school has shown that boys and girls are motivated and attracted by different <coughs> kinds of examples. So we have to seriously take care of these issues if we want not to lose girls and remain in the current situation where we are losing a lot of potential brain power because in our IT workforce only 20% are women. On this specific issue, Informatics Europe is carrying out a cost action called Ugain, focusing exactly on the issue of recovering gender balance in informatics. Last but not the least, take care of the social impact. Like it happened in the two physicists in the aftermath of the Second World War, when the risk of a devastating nuclear war were very high and they stood up to warn mankind of the danger, we have to educate and make everybody aware of the risk 
we might incur into with a careless use of digital technology, both in the small, for example, with bullying or defamation, and in the large, for example, with systemic cyber attacks and disinformation. So we have an important work to do, and everybody's cooperation is needed. Thanks. Thank you, Alberto. I am always, uh, I, I realize how much, not accidentally, there is an alignment between the different presentation and the council recommendation. The more the presentation come in, the more alignment there is, which is promising, of course, for the future. And now, let's move on to a political view. We are lucky enough to have online Victor Negrescu, Member of Parliament, who has been working on this issue for many, many years, despite being very young, he is one, another one of the great advocates that we have in Europe. Mr. Negrescu, do you hear me? Perfect. Welcome. The floor is yours. Of course, uh, first of all, I want to thank the Lisbon Council for organizing this important debate. Uh, it's, it's crucial today, of course, not only to reflect on how we can actually uh, increase digital skills, but also act because we are at the stage where we need to uh, translate uh, policy the strategy that we have at European you know, level uh, in concrete actions. And I listen very careful, of course, to uh, the intervention that uh, was made earlier, underlining some of the things that can be done, but also some of the state needs, demands, issues that have been raised uh, by citizens. And of course, uh, probably you, you already did that, but I think it's very important to put that in a, in a broader context. Where we are today in Europe, and how basically we can act, and what more needs to be done, and of course, what was the significance of European Parliament. I have mentioned that I'm the, the Vice Chair of the Culture and Education Committee of European Parliament, and I'm also guest of European Parliament, and I have been the official rapporteur of European Parliament on digital education, and I have to, of course, underline the fact and the Parliament came up with a very concrete and, and, and well-structured proposal already almost three years ago. And we are still waiting for some of those things to actually happen in the policy that are implemented at the European level by the best day, but also, I mentioned here very clearly, at the European Commission. So, uh, what is happening right now? First of all, is that we are aware of the need to improve skills, digital skills, technological skills on the level of uh, the EU population. So four out of five people that are asked about digital skills say that we will need that, and this will become a crucial uh, competence uh, in the years to come. Therefore, of course, everything will become, let's say, correlated uh, or interdependent with the level of digital skills that I mean here, for instance, uh, of taking jobs but also interacting with the public administration. And this is the dimension that generally is ignored. The fact that we are paying taxes online or that we might interact with the healthcare system uh, through online means. So all those uh, activities that are part of our daily lives are happening and will become more and more uh, digital. So therefore, without those good skills, it will become difficult to remain an active citizen. Uh, uh, in our societies. Nevertheless, despite uh, the, the fact that we are aware of the skills, we are not yet there. Unfortunately, uh, around 30% of the population of European citizens feel that they don't have the adequate the digital skills that they need right now, and probably they will not have the skills that they will need in the future. And this is due to several factors. Firstly, because of lack of training and education. The fact that in their uh, training curriculum, educational curriculum, they didn't integrate enough with digital skills. And this underlines another issue that needs to be raised, that we are not preparing uh, citizens only for today, we are also preparing them for the future. So therefore, we need to design our training facilities, our educational platforms, in order to prepare people for what is now going to happen in the next 10 years or 20 years. And this is crucial. And if we look, of course, in details, we will not see that. We will not see enough uh, the digital skills and technological competencies that are being developed in our schools. And the fact that we are not using 
that potential of universities uh, in, in, in the training and, 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 and skilling of people. Also, uh, in order to, to, to continue on, on, on in, in this line, we have to mention that basically four out of ten people are lacking digital skills. And this is seen, uh, for instance, in the Digital Economy Society Index and uh, in a lot of data. Moreover, if we go to more concrete, let's say, skills related to, to, to STEAM, related to technological competencies, there we see that the lack of competencies is even more simple. Speaking about mathematics, speaking about uh, other technological skills, they are lacking more and more. And because we decided, without a real intention, to consider technological and digital skills as being, at some point, specialized type of skills that people are following or, or, or only by uh, continuing specific uh, specialized studies in those respective fields. But what we see right now is that actually technological competencies and digital skills today are needed in all professions. If we are political science, like many scientists like myself, or you who are working in a factory, if you are a designer or if you are working in programming, you need digital skills, different kind of digital skills. We don't have only one type of digital competence. We have a variety of digital skills, tools, and platform technological skills that people are needing right now and will need uh, in the future. And of course, we have growing digital skills gaps. You mentioned between uh, men and women, but also between uh, uh, urban and rural areas, between developed communities and less developed communities, between schools, between universities, depending on their access to financing. So at the level of European Parliament, we underlined those challenges already three years ago, uh, mentioning that uh, the fact that we need a proper tool, a proper assessment, and a proper strategy. The Commission invited to our call, they came up with a strategy in this regard. But again, if we follow the numbers and the data, things are not happening as we plan uh, them to happen. Despite the opportunities, for instance, the European Parliament was going to ask to allocate at least 10% of the recovery plans for education. And what you most of this amendment uh, in the proposal of the European Parliament regarding, uh, regarding the regulation on the recovery plan, it, this idea was introduced as a recommendation, and right now we have across member states, around 10% going for education from their recovery plan. So roughly we can speak about uh, 75 billion euros that are supposed to go in different member states to uh, education. A large part of that sum is going to digital trade. But again, here oh, we don't have a common approach. What people are learning in Romania, uh, might, uh, people might not learn it in Italy. Where there is no coordination, no common policy, no common framework. We are not sharing skills, we are not sharing know-how, we are not sharing trainings, trainers, we are not sharing curriculums. Because we tend to say education is national competence, but nevertheless, we could have maybe cooperated further on those respective topics in order to have, let's say, a multiplication effect and an enhanced impact when it comes to training. Generally, this is happening also with digital skills, despite the fact that skills are more linked to uh, the European dimension. We have right now the European Year for Skills, and there, again, we are lacking coordination. For instance, we all know that we are lacking uh, 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 trainers and professors in ICT fields. And uh, uh, there is a competition right now happening at European level. So, the countries that have a bigger budget for educational skills uh, will try and do their best, they are currently doing that, to attract the best trainers and professors from the countries that do not have such a significant budget, at least for the salaries of those people. So instead of building a strong common market, we introduce competition in the training and skills, which can be good, but which also generates a lot of challenges and, and, and problems. Again, we are reflecting about ways of moving forward, creating common certificates. Uh, and I think, of course, online certificates are also important. 
the European Parliament, and this was an issue that they raised, uh, asked the European Commission to create uh, a common framework of cooperation for online certificates at European level. Because now, for instance, you can, as a, a learner, go online and easily find the certificates that are offered by US universities on digital skills, or US suppliers, or even Chinese suppliers. But the European universities are doing the same, but instead of putting their knowledge together in common platforms or common projects, we are still, again, dividing. We are trying, nevertheless, to push forward for this coordination between educational suppliers. We have the European University initiatives, but we could have developed an online platform focused for universities, but not only for them, that will offer uh, those opportunities to as many people as possible. Some of the, those uh, potential uh, training opportunities could have been offered even freely or should have been financed by the EU because, again, as I said, we have uh, the resources. The European Parliament also called, for instance, for an initiative to introduce uh, AI and robotics education as early as possible uh, in schools. We have countries that exceed, we have regions, to be very frank, that are doing a great job in this direction, but the large part of uh, European countries and regions are not doing so well. Because I was telling you earlier that we need to prepare for the future. So AI will certainly become crucial for uh, our societies in the years to come and for finding a job. So we need to learn about uh, the ethics of AI, but also in the same time how we can use those different tools, robotics or AI, uh, in our daily lives. And for that, we need a coordinated approach and learning from each other. I think Europe offers a great potential to learn uh, rapidly from the mistakes and the positive examples and speed up the process. But again, this is not happening despite, as you have mentioned earlier, the recommendations of the Council, because they, or at least for me and for the Parliament, they seem, uh, they are nice recommendations, we tend to agree with them, but there is no complete follow up. This is why we call, and I will finish with this last idea, we call for uh, a better integration of, uh, of the evaluation of, on what is happening on digital skills uh, in the European semester format. So the Commission is conducting uh, really one or two reports for countries on what is happening in those respective countries in different fields. And we ask, we partially got it, but not fully, to have a real assessment of what is happening in different member states, but also with follow up uh, ideas and actions in order to make sure. We are not leaving anyone behind. We are actually using the potential. We are actually using the fund. We are actually involving the private sector. We are actually involving teachers associations, parent associations, and local authorities. And we are actually building the European education area that was supposed to be finalized by the end of the year. And now we heard that the Commission understood 2025 would be the end of 2025. So at least we hope that by the end of 2025, we will have the European Education Area, and those clear ideas that are just on the line and that you have on the line will be integrated there. So I think your debate is happening at crucial time to raise this issue, raise awareness, underline what more can be done, but also to show that we have a very vivid, vivid, active community in the field of technological and digital skills that wants to contribute. So uh, let's ask uh, our the decision makers at EU level and national level to keep their doors, that have already landing, their doors open uh, to, uh, to allow everyone to participate in the process. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> what you say is very important, and I think uh, I like a lot the urgency that you put in this. I think if there is one real enemy for us here today is complacency. We cannot feel complacent. The council recommendation doesn't mean that the job is done, it's the job is starting. So thank you for your sense of urgency. We are running a bit late. We always are very strict with time at the Lisbon Council, but sometimes it slips. And uh, we have now the final intervention by uh, Ms. Angeloga Casteva, uh, and uh, we will get a couple of questions afterwards. But 
Ms. Sengelova, how, how, what did you hear today that, what does it mean for the implementation of the Council recommendation and most importantly, how can we help? Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, David. Indeed, many thanks to the Lisbon Council for organizing today's uh, uh, discussion. It's a very pertinent one. Uh, with all the distinguished speakers uh, before me, of course, uh, we all heard how complex this issue is, uh, actually, and how um, diverse perspectives are involved in actually uh, tackling uh, digital education and uh, digital skills and competencies. All speakers actually referred to the need um, to develop digital skills and competencies, about uh, the urgency. Uh, it's been also mentioned that uh, this is nothing new to us. It's been already a lot done, a lot's been invested. But of course, with the current pace, we cannot keep up with the pace of uh, uh, digital technologies development. And it is clear to everyone. So I believe there is no place for complacency. And the very fact that uh, the member states have adopted uh, these recommendations is an acknowledgement. It's a commitment on the side of the uh, member states. Uh, my Director General Pierre mentioned earlier today about the preparation of the two council recommendations and that uh, they involved a lot of uh, uh, initial consultations and discussions. And that was an extremely important <coughs> process for the Commission. Uh, simply because it requires the support and active engagement at uh, various levels. It's clear that when we talk about digital education, it's not about Ministry of Education only. There are many other sectors involved and their commitment and their active participation is crucial. Uh, it is clear that we need to address issues like connectivity, infrastructure, Ministry of Finance to fund all the various strategies and initiatives, also the employment, labor, research, not necessary to mention them all. But what is important is also to make sure that there is cooperation uh, with the private sector, with uh, uh, parent organizations, uh, with civil society. And that's been something uh, that the Commission has uh, uh, promoted and will continue promoting. It's taken up also by the member states as a whole of government, all of a society approach. We cannot actually tackle these issues uh, alone and uh, this is clear that they have to be um, addressed at various levels by various stakeholders. So this is the first thing. I already mentioned the diversity and complexity of these issues and obviously we cannot, uh, um, we cannot, I cannot go through the whole uh, uh, range of issues. I would like to highlight only a few ones. Uh, what was mentioned by uh, Mr. Negrescu just uh, uh, in his uh, um, uh, last intervention is about the need to uh, coordinate and cooperate and that indeed uh, the Commission, we have limited uh, competencies at uh, EU level. This is clear, but what is also important is to uh, note that success is a sign, someone said, and we need to get actually the conditions right in order, in order to get the results. And this is what we are doing through these recommendations. We are setting uh, a framework for cooperation between member states. On the Commission side, of course, more than, uh, more than agreeing with what was said, uh, that uh, uh, a lot more coordination, cooperation, exchange of good practices uh, is uh, indeed uh, needed, peer learning, and this is what we are trying to do. Uh, we are encouraging uh, all these actions and uh, um, inclusivity is something that was mentioned, uh, but also high quality accessibility of uh, digital education are indeed key values for us and they're driving our work. So this is the first thing I wanted to underline. The second point, when we talk about uh, digital education and in particular digital skills and here I agree very much with Enrico it is indeed um, crucial that we have uh, a pathway in building these digital uh, skills and competencies uh, it is indeed uh, crucial that we start uh, at a very early uh, age and this is something which is reflected in the uh, recommendations I will not go into detail it was indeed very inspiring to hear from Hadi about his experience, his personal story and what Code.org is doing. For us, uh, at EU level, uh, many of you uh, probably know and you might have experienced, we have the EU Code Week, which uh, to a great extent 
uh, has been inspired by Code Oak. And uh, this is a grassroots uh, uh, movement, and I believe uh, there are a lot of talented people who learn from each other, who like to create and to collaborate in building digital skills. But what we found out is this is not enough. We need a much more structured approach. And this is what we would like actually to support as an effort at EU level. Simply without going into details, I'll just mention that uh, this will be a central issue for the Commission because in the recommendation on uh, informatics and uh, computer science, it is mentioned that the Commission will support high um, uh, high quality uh, informatics and uh, uh, computer science in cooperation with member states and stakeholders. Uh, this is uh, really crucial, again, coming back to the issue of uh, competencies, and this will be uh, offered on a voluntary uh, basis. So there will be a lot of work around this. It is uh, crucial to look what it means to teach informatics, what are the criteria, the requirements, uh, but what means, what it also means to look at the different practices. We know that in one or another way, all member states teach digital skills, informatics, either separately or integrated with other subjects like mathematics or transversely. But uh, by discussing these issues, we would like to issue guidance and support uh, teachers and educators in uh, further taking informatics uh, forward. A very last word uh, on uh, artificial intelligence. Obviously, again, uh, this is, uh, continues to be the hottest topic, and I fully agree with Hadi, who said that uh, it will have a dramatic impact, uh, revolutionizing uh, education and training, and we see actually uh, a lot of take up uh, by students, and we expect by teachers, but what is crucial is indeed to understand what it means uh, artificial intelligence transformative, now generative artificial intelligence, and what is uh, the impact. Uh, you all know that a lot has been done at EU level, a lot of policy initiatives and acts uh, have been already adopted, just to mention the recent um, adoption of the AI Act, but also the European Data Strategy and the uh, European uh, Digital um, Single Act, uh, Single Service Act. So these are all important. I'm simply mentioning in them to say that we have to continue assessing the implications on education and training and how they are implemented. Uh, being absolutely cautious about, uh, 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 conscious about the, the time limits, uh, allow me just to uh, uh, close uh, my intervention by answering your question, what all this means uh, for the implementation of the uh, Council recommendations. I believe this means a lot of work, hard work and uh, a lot of uh, uh, joint efforts, uh, close collaboration between the various stakeholders involved at, uh, various, uh, uh, at various levels. Uh, I believe that by these uh, joint efforts we can live up uh, to the ambitions uh, that we have in Europe but also cooperate uh, globally because technology doesn't have borders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I promise to open the mic for a couple of questions. If there are, please short. Okay. Please. Uh, There was a millisecond difference between two. Thank you. Yes. Can you hear me? If you can introduce yourself. This is a question for everyone on the panel. Can you introduce yourself? Pardon? My, ma my name is Jose Pietri. I live in Paris and I'm with Mindshare Consulting. But especially for Hadi, uh, but all four of you, I'd, I'd like you to answer the question of knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? And how would you adapt to Europe? Thank you. I go on? Yeah, okay. please. Uh, I'm the co-director of Code and Play, an NGO based in Brussels, I mean in Belgium. And uh, so this question addressed all panelists is, we haven't heard uh, another issue, which is a, a teaching uh, shortage. So we are working on the field and uh, convincing and inspiring kids, no problem. This we succeed very well. Even though if you want to be a role model, I would be really glad to put you on a video. <laughs> but 
to convince teachers, to give them the tools, the skills, but also the conviction that computational thinking is really important. This is a huge issue, and particularly with the, the cloud above our head with the shortage. To recruit teachers and to keep them motiva uh, motivated. So if we could have your science on this, I would be really glad. Thank you. Uh, so maybe we can go first Hadi, then Enrico, and then Santana and stop. please. Um, sure, the first question was knowing uh, what I know now, what would I have done differently? Uh, this is actually a tough question because we've had a phenomenal level of success far above my expectations, so it's hard to uh, think that we could have done better. I, I, I still pinch myself to just think about how much we've done in the last 10 years. Uh, but if I could go back, one of the things I probably would have done differently is thinking mobile first uh, in terms of the platform we built because in roughly half of the world students can't use code.org because it's designed for laptops and, or tablets and they have mobile phones. Uh, fortunately that's not an issue uh, in the EU broadly uh, but it's definitely an issue if you think about Latin America or large parts of India or Africa uh, which are the places that have the least usage of code.org. Uh, and you also asked in terms of uh, adapting things to the EU. Uh, I'm not enough of an expert, so I'll leave that uh, for, for the other members of the panel. Uh, but what I would say is, I'll repeat the thing I mentioned early on, which is the emphasis on creativity is, I think, the most important reason to teach computer science, because the school system in the entire world has been more about memorization and rote repetition, and students are getting tired of that, and giving them creativity is, is something that will not only help them teach, learn computer science, it will get them excited about learning again. Um, and lastly, for the question about convincing teachers, uh, for us, the most effective way to convince teachers to teach computer science is to try it. Uh, when teachers do an hour of code in their classroom, and that's actually the number one reason we invented the hour of code, wasn't to hook the students, it was to hook the teachers. Because if you tell a teacher, oh, you should teach a computer science class, that's too big of a commitment. Teaching one hour, it's a little bit you know, easier to do. It's not a huge commitment, and especially if other teachers are doing it, it feels like, okay, we're all gonna do this together. And then after that one hour, roughly 80% of teachers say they wanna continue teaching computer science. So that's a very <laughs> significant uh, conversion rate. Yeah. Right. Fantastic, thanks, Enrico. Okay, so I, I'll just comment on the second part, uh, recruiting teachers. It's usually a complex issue and do not have easy answer. Uh, I mean, it's important to look back. I mean, uh, Code.org started 10 years ago. So in 10 years they did a wonderful job, but there is still much more work to do. So recruiting teachers is even more complex than what Codorg has done and we have been doing in Italy. So it's, first of all, an issue where I think politicians have to understand that this is the issue. If they do not understand, there is nothing that can be done because solving this issue requires money. Just one example, it's clear that teachers are not attracted by money. So if you want to convince them to educate themselves and to teach something new, you have also to use beyond the personal motivation, creativity that are important, but there is also the money issue. So investing on teachers and educating them will require also money. Also because all current teachers are teaching and beyond being teachers, they have a family, they have other things to do. So you cannot just take them and bring them somewhere else. And so it, it is a very complex issue and it cannot be solved in a couple of years. It will require at least 10 years. And what's, what's, uh, what's uh, more important is that politicians in each country, because then we know that each country has its own way of educating teachers, path to uh, professional development and so on, each politician in each country understand that this is the issue and they start yesterday. They should have started yesterday to work on it. They have not yet started on it. So, but this is, this is the most important one and it will, it will require time. Luckily, for a primary school, we don't need to educate teachers for so much time because it's, it's, a, it's a small part, it's just, I mean, 
uh, Adi spoke about uh, one, one hour uh, in the school year. I mean, that, that, that's enough to get uh, interest people, but to have some education, I think one hour a week would be enough. And you don't need so much to educate teachers to do this, but you need to bring all teachers to do this. This is also the challenge. Computer science or informatics education is not something only for the most brilliant teachers of most brilliant school. It's for everybody. And for an educational system to change so that everybody get the basis of a new discipline requires time, requires investment. In primary school can be done easier, much easier. In middle school you require some more investment. And then in a high secondary school you need more. But in the end it's not important that everybody get a job as a programmer. I mean, what is important is every citizen understand the basic of the digital world like every citizen understand the basic of the physical world. Nobody thinks that uh, uh, Apple fall down because of some magic and nobody thinks that uh, a newborn uh, uh, are, uh, are, are birthed in, in a field. E everybody of us understand there is some science behind our uh, industrial Thank world, so everybody has to understand there is some science beyond the digital world. And it, it needs you. little. Thank you. Thank you, Enrico. Antonetta, your yeah. final word? Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for the questions. I think that uh, what we heard from Hadi very much resonates with us. Of course, uh, it's very difficult to translate one uh, success uh, from one place to another in uh, uh, the same uh, way, uh, but certainly uh, with regard to the implementation uh, and the specific elements that were presented, we see them also translated or kind of um, very much uh, uh, covered by the two council recommendations. So I very much believe that uh, the implementation of the council recommendations will bring to such success. Having said that, uh, I'm particularly uh, grateful for the question on teachers because I didn't have the time to mention it, though for us it is uh, hugely important. Just to highlight that in the council recommendations we look uh, and uh, I mean expect and encourage member states to take particular actions in that regard uh, for uh, two reasons. First of all, the general um, development of digital skills competencies understanding of all teachers irrespective of what kind of subjects they teach. And the second one is the more uh, specific specialized training of teachers, those who will train informatics, uh, for example, there we need more targeted uh, actions. Uh, there has been um, uh, uh, this, the so-called ET monitor, the uh, education and training monitor. Some of you may know that last year, last edition, which was published in December, actually it was focused on the teacher's uh, um, profession. So we are very much aware about the challenges. A lot has been done at national level to actually stimulate um, the, uh, how to say, the uh, recognition of this profession, to address the challenges. Uh, there are different measures that are taken actually for the training of teachers at yeah. very initial level, but also professional uh, development, which is required. Of course, countries yeah. go at different uh, area and what, at a different uh, pace. What we are trying to uh, ensure is really cooperation, collaboration, exchange of good practices. So I stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I, I, I loved when the meeting is too short. It means there is a lot to say. But of course, we still have Mr. Negrescu with us. Mr. Negrescu, we would love to have your final comments. If they can be brief, because we are dramatically out of time. Thank you. The, word is, the floor is yours. Wait, audio. One second. Try, try to speak. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so for the first question, uh, what I would have loved to do more is to really speak specifically on how the 10% or education of the upper plan should be spent by member states. So I won't complete that. Yeah. Uh, Stepping on the issue of teachers, I have raised it. I mentioned the issue of the competition. Uh, I think there uh, are a lot of things that can be done. Uh, I heard one of the saying politicians are bad. I am personally involved in politics, but I'm also a teacher, so I don't know if I'm bad or not. Uh, but the one they say that really we need to do more is stimulating uh, trainers, is stimulating teachers. We need a real career path. We need, of course, to integrate digital skills in their training. Uh, and we need to work with them. Uh, this is clear. We cannot uh, decide things related to education from nice offices. 
you will need to really speak with the people involved. And, and, and we can learn a lot from them. From yourselves, training geology involved in the process, from the private sector, that also about training, but also from teachers, parents, and people. Uh, and obviously, it's not easy. You know, obviously, it's not easy. <laughs> but uh, uh, education is very complicated. There is no perfect model. But uh, we need to do more of that because without investing in education and we keep the skills, uh, we are going to lose a lot. Our societies are going to lose a lot. And, uh, you know, no one did it on purpose, but it's a fact. Yeah. Technological skills, digital skills, AI skills are needed right now. And uh, it, it's really urgent. And I have to say that I, I stole speakers, I know many of them. With this uh, idea of we are working very closely. Uh, I think we are people that are really wanting to do more on education yourself as well. So let us not give up and let's do more of that. And uh, again, uh, the Lipon Council really did a good job in raising really this important issue. Well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And I would like now to close uh, the, the, the summit. I would like to thank you all, thank all the speakers, thank the fantastic team at the Lisbon Council that helped uh, making this uh, happen. I also would like to note that Ross Timmer will take on board everything that's been said here for the policy roadmap that's preparing. And I want to say there is one thing I don't like in the recommendation. Uh, there is a, some sort of compte rendu in five years. Uh, I think we should uh, learn from Hadi and make it real time and I'm sure we will soon meet again to take stock of progress in about a year and I hope you will all join us in this. So thank you very much and thanks for the question.